Hello, um, we are just seeing folks beginning to enter now, but welcome to um, this week's uh, New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Um, we'll just get going in about a minute as I'm seeing folks um, enter into the, into the webinar today. Okay, so I'm starting to see uh, the numbers slow down. So um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we have a great presentation um, for you. And before I turn it over to um, Dr. Francis Levin to introduce our speaker for today, I just wanted to um, announce next week's um, speaker. So next week we have Dr. Uh, Mary Phillips, who is the Pittsburgh Foundation Emmeling Endowed Chair in Psychotic Disorders, and she's also a professor um, in psychiatry and clinical and translational science at the University of Pittsburgh. And the title of her talk next week will be Reward and Emotion Regulation, Using Neuroscience to Develop New Brain-Based Treatments for Bipolar Disorder. Um, and so she will be here with us next week. Um, and before we uh, begin today's talk, I just wanna remind people that we're gonna prioritize questions from trainees during the discussion after today's talk. So we do encourage everyone to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window, so not the chat, the Q&A feature. Um, and if you are a tra trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question, and we're going to prioritize your questions to um, our speaker today. So Fran, over to you. Thank you, Kate. Um, it's really wonderful to be here today. Uh, this is uh, uh, endowed lectureship uh, in 2016, Eric D. Hadar made a generous gift from the Eric D. Hadar Family Foundation for $2 million to support substance use disorders. The gift was established as an endowed fund to support the Eric D. Hadar Lecture, an annual lecture series focused on substance use disorders, of which we are very pleased to present the sixth annual lecture today and the uh, Eric e. D. Hadar Research Fund, which advances research by providing resources for fellowship and faculty support, research projects, and laboratory infrastructure, including the Eric D. Hadar Fellows. We're extremely grateful for Eric's partnership in this area and his foresight in establishing these funds, which are instrumental in not only facilitating pioneering research, but also effectively distributing information on the field of substance use disorders. Through lectures such as these, the division is able to foster collaboration and disseminate the most promising discoveries in the field to colleagues across our institution and throughout the scientific community. The annual lecture is in memory of Dr. Herbert Kleber, a compassionate clinician and unparalleled leader in the substance use disorder field. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Steve Shapta. The title of his talk is Medications as Foundation for Stimulant Use Disorder Treatment, Is It Time? And I'll just briefly describe Steve. Steve has been a long time close colleague and friend. Uh, we had a delightful dinner last night uh, and I'm so pleased to have him here today. Uh, Steve Shoptar is a clinical psychologist. He's a professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Family Medicine at UCLA. He is also a professor in the departments of psychiatry at UCLA and at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Dr. Shoptar's research involves developing medications and behavioral interventions for stimulant and opiate use disorders, especially in the context of HIV transmission. He directs two centers at UCLA, the Center for HIV Identification, Prevention and Treatment Services, and the Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine, and is the multiple PI of NIDA's Clinical Trials Network, Big, Big Southwest Node. Dr. Shoptar is also the protocol co-chair for an HIV Prevention's Trial Network study, which is providing integrated peer navigation and medication services for opiate use disorder, HIV care and prevention, primary care and STD testing and treatment in a mobile unit compared to peer navigation to existing services in five US cities. His international work includes studies in Vietnam and South Africa, studying treatments for addiction and HIV transmission. And for his service work, Steve is an active member of local task force guided public health department and community-based collaborative responses to methamphetamine treatment and prevention which is especially important in Los Angeles where overdoses and deaths from methamphetamine are very high. Also, Dr. Shoptar is the incoming editor-in-chief of Drug and Alcohol Dependence and a leading journal on addiction science. Uh, I'm so delighted to have you here, Steve. I'm sure the talk's gonna be great and we all welcome you. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Hold on, let me pull up the slides here. 
I want to say, first of all, thank you very much. That was a lovely introduction. It was a lovely dinner last night. Um, thanks to the Columbia team. Uh, some of my peers, I think, are on the call today. I think uh, probably uh, Dr. Elbasau uh, is here, my co-chair with the HBTN study, and, and Bob Remian, who is uh, our uh, uh, assist, he, he runs the sister center at uh, the UCLA, I'm sorry, the uh, HIV Center here at uh, Columbia, which is, which is uh, linked with our CHIP Center. So lots of friends, and it's really great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, and also, thank you so much, uh, Eric Hadar. It was a wonderful dinner last night, and you're doing such great work here. I appreciate all the things you're doing. So here are my disclosures, and I want to recognize that a lot of my work has been funded by NIDA, uh, NIMH, and by uh, NIAID. But really, one of the biggest acknowledgments, as, as, as Francis was talking about, is that is, is Walter. Walter Ling is my mentor, and he is someone who has pulled together uh, with Herb Kleber and with Chuck O'Brien an amazing uh, cohort of people of which I'm lucky to be one. Um, and I just wanted to say that of all the things that I've learned, it's really about hanging around with Walter and Chuck and with, with Herb and with all of the people who they brought to the table to learn and to talk about addiction. It's largely shaped my thinking and I don't want to get like sappy about this, but it is really nice to be part of, it's a privilege to be part of that group. So Today we'll be talking about understanding the epidemiology of stimulant use disorders globally and in endemic areas. I want to pay attention as we go through this, not only to some of the biology, but also the factors of culture and comorbidities that people often have with a stimulant use disorder. We're going to talk about the neurobiology in the development and maintenance of stimulant use disorders and how these relate to treatment choices. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but it's more than just neurons. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a complete feedback loop about how behavior uh, affects brain and, and back and forth. Um, we're going to review evidence for advancements in pharmacotherapies and behavioral therapies that can be brought, brought into practice. And we're going to end with this idea about uh, considering, considering integrative strategies as opposed to single areas of expertise and intervention for treating people with stimulant use disorder. So I always like to start with what it is we're studying. And so in these bodies, the primary drive is toward health. Um, so when you think about addiction as a disease, you know, you, you have to think about it in terms of a spectrum, or at least that's how I like to think about it. And with apologies to, to the ASAM folks, you know, I like to think of the spectrum where either most people don't use the drug or they use it in a way that doesn't cause problems. And that's the, that's the larger side of this prism. And that's when things using uh, drugs is fun. We were talking about this last night. When does fun move into fun with problems? Um, and that is when the people here who are fewer people in the middle here who are having occasional use that causes problems occasionally or frequently, but they don't put down the pipe or they don't put down, they don't put down the, the, the syringe or they don't, they can't stop. That means that health, the natural drive toward health is not working any longer. Um, so as you begin to continue use, what you end up with is just problems. And then the whole reason why you started with fun is, is gone. And now it's just about problems where you have smaller numbers of people involved with mild to moderate substance use disorder. And for those who continue to use after that, you head into severe addiction. So this is the way we psychiatrists and, and scientists like to think about things is like with these criteria sets. Um, I, I present this analog versus digital sort of thinking about the, the disorder because it kind of helps you understand how it is that there are these distinctions. We overlay these criteria on people in terms of coming up with, you actually ask these questions of one to 11 and you tick off the numbers of, of responses that people have. And based upon whether it's two or three, it's mild. If it's four or five, it's moderate. If it's six or more, it's severe. With these criteria being maladaptive patterns of use that cause clinically significant impairment or distress. That, that, that is in italics because that's important. If, it's, if there's no clinically significant impairment or distress, you don't have the definition of a disorder. You don't have the diagnosis. You're in that green part. Um, so 
<clears throat> you can have Mount or the yellow part of the spectrum. Why do I spend time with this? <clears throat> because when we measure around the world, what goes on with you know, where people are using drugs and how many people are using drugs, it's really just a head count. And it really fails to take into the effect of what's happening when people are using drugs. Here we see in the latest data from UNODC that uh, in terms of uh, annual prevalence of cocaine use, two areas of the world have the highest percentages. One is not surprisingly North America, but this one over here was sort of a little surprising to me, which is Australia and New Zealand. Um, still not quite sure how, what that's about because that cocaine has to travel a long way to get to the Australia, uh, Australia region. If we look at cocaine use in the, in the, in the US, so that was about 2% right uh, around the world. So if you look at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, generally speaking, it's about 2% in American adults who will report using cocaine in a year with a substantial elevation here for folks who are in the higher group, about 6 to 7% in the younger group, 18 to 25. Um, and relates to a question that we were talking about last night at dinner, which is why do people continue to use a drug after that? Why do they taste it? And then why do they continue to use it? Well, 18 to 25 is a developmental phase in life when you're supposed to experience things that are a little bit risky. Um, so tasting a drug during that period fits with these data very nicely, showing that a lot of people normally do. But as we showed before, a lot of people don't go on to collect, have data, uh, have problems. In terms of methamphetamine prevalence, Michael Farrell published uh, a, a very comprehensive review uh, in Lancet showing that, the again, the highest rate of prevalence of methamphetamine use is here in Australia. It's uh, at one time 6% of the population was using methamphetamine. It's, it's not as bad now, but it's still pretty much of a problem in Australia. Um, and you can see here that the warmer colors here are the ones, the countries and the areas where we have a high relevance, uh, high prevalence. And you can see it's, it's uh, US um, over to the right is Southeast Asia and some part of uh, Europe. Um, in looking at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, what we see is there's a, about uh, less than 1% of the population reports using methamphetamine in the past year. We're gonna pay attention to these data because it will come back in a different slide for cocaine use. But, but the idea here of, of, of seeing here that it's just, if you look across the population, it's very low. But among people who are already using other drugs like heroin or LSD, you can see a 20 to 30% uh, prevalence for people who are reporting heroin use um, and uh, LSD use is also elevated. So that's, th these are important. And then finally, I wanna leave this point of epidemiology with this, with this very outstanding uh, uh, debate that's, that was brought up by Peter Ruder and group at uh, University of Maryland, talking about whether the National Survey on Drug Use and Health provides enough sensitivity to be able to give us these general population survey estimates. Um, I, I recommend this re for reading, um, and it, it's something that actually has changed my thinking in terms of understanding the saturation and the consistency of the, of the addiction problem in the U.S. Um, here's one final look at this, and that is that we know that stimulants are highly involved with overdose deaths, and uh, this is a very packed slide. So if we look here, you can see that over the years, we see this increase of all deaths involving um, psychostimulants. Um, and if you, this is, these are data by Hedegaard from CDC showing that if you partial out how, which drugs are involved, you can see that psychostimulants plus opioids and psychostimulants alone are almost around the same rate, uh, which, is, which is fascinating. And it's always, always good to remember that when we're talking about polysubstance, it's always good to understand the roots of what we're talking about. Here, 2009 to 2012 is the first wave of the opioid epidemic, with apologies to Dan Caccioni, um, that this is where people were prescribing pills for pain um, and people were getting hooked. And we can see what the overdose deaths were like there. Between 2012 to 2015, the second wave takes place, which is heroin use, where people are shut off from the pills from their doctors and they have to go onto the streets to get their opioids. Um, the third wave is fentanyl starting around 2015 to 2017-ish. And you can see that that's when the deaths really started to take off, both due to um, uh, 
the combined effects of these poly substance use. And then looking here at this last wave where you see just fentanyl plus opioids plus stimulants and seeing this J curve in deaths, which we know is continued. So it, it's, it's, it's a serious substantial problem out there. Um, it's, a, it's also, we just, our, my group just had a meeting on the, the issues of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, one of the things that we found out in this meeting is that there are two causes that are not genetic for pulmonary hypertension. One is HIV and the other is methamphetamine use. And you can see that that actually is a, reflected here in the, um, in the data of acute heart failure by stimulant use in the national inpatient sample, showing that this maps, this rise of number and percent, the number is blue, the red is per percent of hospitalizations has been continuing to, uh, on the same slope increase over the past few years, and it's continuing still. Um, I wanna focus a little bit about, you know, the issue of people continuing to use drugs in spite of the fact that they may hurt their their health. And one of the reasons why people uh, may begin or continue to use drugs really relates to uh, not only the effects that they have, and you can see over here in the red and the green, uh, the, the red and the green, the green is for plus good things and, and red is sort of like it's a reduction. Uh, so increases green, red is, is reductions. And you can see that the, the package of methamphetamine fits very nicely, especially within certain groups like gay men, where this, this drug gets integrated with sexual behaviors, which can cause problems for uh, infectious disease. It works uh, for a while for people who are doing shift work, people who are doing two jobs to be able to pay the rent. Uh, an increasing story in our metropolitan areas where rents go up and job wages tend to stay stagnant. So people are um, using this drug. The bikers, um, the, the gang members, methamphetamine is very popular, uh, not only for sales, but also for the effects that happen, facilitating sex, um, other sorts of things that happen. Uh, women, methamphetamine has almost um, even a representation of women. It's not quite even, but it's close. Um, and part of that is because it does help women to uh, we maintain weight loss, have energy, clean house, and be interested in sex at the end of the day with their husbands. So, so the idea here about um, this working is, is, is particularly so in, 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 in Utah, where uh, this, this drug fits very nicely with the, with the culture to be able to support all of those activities um, in, 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 in raising children and, and being uh, members in, in, in the population there. And Utah is the one place where there is actual in your, uh, when you sell a house, you have to have an affidavit that says that this house was not used as a methamphetamine lab. Um, and then finally, Ruth, your uh, rural and youth folks, methamphetamine actually helps you either dance and have fun as a youth, or if you're in rural areas, um, and also if you're young, it helps time, time pass. So, you know, it helps you to sit quietly and watch paint dry. Um, so those are, those are real advantages on the cultural side of what happens with people. When we look at particularly at the cultural interaction between uh, uh, gay men and methamphetamine, we see that there is a, a, an astounding and significant attributable fraction, meaning that this factor actually attributes for um, HIV incidents, going from HIV negative to HIV positive in MSM at very high rates. These data are somewhat old, but they're from two very large cohorts in the United States. One is Project Explore, um, which was an HIV prevention study, um, and the other is by the MAX, which is the multi-site AIDS co cohort study. And in both of these, um, among HIV negative men who have sex with men, uh, use of methamphetamine car, uh, predicted HIV incidence in 16% of cases um, for Project Explore and 33% of cases in MAX. So something like that means that something is going on. Uh, part of my work at home about the methamphetamine HIV interaction is really driven on trying to understand the mechanisms that might be at play here. It's not just the behavioral mechanism of having more sex or more risky sex, but we also know that methamphetamine, kind of relating back to that pulmonary hypertension idea, um, pushes pro-inflammatory cytokine release, not only circulating throughout blood, but also in certain compartments. And we've measured this in, in gut, and we, we're starting to think about looking in cardiovascular compartment as well. For cocaine, we see uh, 
in, in the national survey on drug use and health, the, the, the 2 percent slide from before, and the, we also see uh, uh, concomitant reports of uh, psychiatric symptoms. And you can see of that 2 percent across the population that are using methamp or cocaine in a year, about a third will report serious psychological distress. Um, 20% about will have major depressive episodes with a significant amount having serious thoughts of suicide, an uncomfortable number of who have made plans or attempts, and unfortunately, a small number of those folks who have <clears throat> actually sought treatment. So what we also see with stimulants, uh, both methamphetamine and cocaine, is this very uncomfortable, not only polysubstance use, but also this idea that you have concomitant uh, psychiatric problems that are ongoing, and also infectious disease. I can't not give a talk without talking about tobacco, particularly in talking about stimulants. Um, this is a paper that was published by um, uh, Colby Pissarro, who's now a fourth year um, emergency room resident, <coughs> a resident in emergency medicine who did a 20-year follow-up <clears throat> on an original study done by uh, Kathy Reback and I, uh, testing out what happens when you give uh, gay men who are methamphetamine addicted uh, 16 weeks of behavioral, different behavioral therapies. Um, we've published that data. We'll get to it in a little bit about some of this. But, but the idea here was it was a very positive signal for contingency management. And what Colby did is in California, we have an easy access to death records. So he went through all of our, our participant list and just sought the, sought the publicly available um, uh, um, death certificates for people who had died in the 20 years when we, from when we did this first trial. And what we see here is if, you, if we look at just the mortality rate for uh, men who were smoking, uh, who uh, gay, bisexual men, who had meth, uh, HIV and tobacco use, compared to um, men who had none of those issues, uh, general sample, non-methamphetamine using, non-HIV positive and non-tobacco use, you see a 16.9 per 1,000 person year uh, crude mortality rate. And you see this sort of stepwise addition to um, lethality from smoking. Um, and here we see it in terms of these are the outcomes of our study participants uh, plotted by whether they smoked. Um, they all had, um, uh, so some had HIV, about two thirds did, and, and these middle ones in here, these are the HIV negative men who participated. And you can see that not smoking with HIV was far more um, health promoting than HIV plus smoking. And HIV plus smoking was the absolute worst and significantly uh, predicted people dying. So that's, that's an important point. We wanna make sure that uh, we pay attention to these poly substances that people are engaged with when, when, we're, um, when we're thinking about what's going on with our folks. So this is a good time to think about, well, okay, that's all fine and good, Steve, but what does that have to do with anything? So let's talk about the neurobiology. Um, one of the things that I want to, as we start to go down this rabbit hole is, is to remember that all behavior is brain expressed. This is really important because many people, particularly as we kind of think you know, loosely about people and their behavior, we have this dualist idea that there is a man in the machine pulling levers or there's this distinction between the person and the behavior, but it's really all behavior is brain expressed, including motivated or automatic behaviors that are involved in stimulant use disorder. Um, that cocaine and methamphetamine both have direct effects on neurons and stimulating and sustaining dopamine release, and that behavioral and potential medication therapies have mechanisms that can affect neurotransmission, which in turn correspond with behavior change. This is the argument for actually thinking about pulling together uh, medication and behavior therapies because they all affect the brain. Um, what we know is that cocaine primarily blocks dopamine transporters. Methamphetamine and amphetamine will inhibit dopamine uptake and increase reverse transport of dop dopamine into the cleft. 
And we also know that methamphetamine has different effects at low dose. So you can use methamphetamine or amphetamine as a treatment agent at low dose. Um, and it actually will block transport and it will have beneficial effects for people who need the effects like organizing behavior. If you have ADHD or paying attention, if you have uh, hyperactivity or uh, those sorts of things. Um, but when you begin to take high doses, like a quarter gram a day of methamphetamine, what happens is that shifts, that adds another tech, uh, another effect, which is to re reverse dopamine transport. Why is that? I'm going to go just briefly over why that's important. But Glenn Hansen, a prior NIDA, um, uh, head of NIDA, actually has done some very elegant work in showing how that this low dose and high dose are very distinct in their effects. And that that is an important thing to remember that all medications, there's all medications, all drugs have different effects in how they're used. Um, and both of these drugs, drugs, cocaine and methamphetamine, affect serotonin and nor nor norepinephrine transporters. So we're going to turn over to the left side of the slide here now and just kind of like walk through some of this. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's not as complex as it looks. This is from Ashok from George Koob's group that talks about the, the neurobiology and the dopaminergic alterations in stimulant users. And forgive me for oversimplifying this, but basically these arrows here, these chevrons are actually up or down arrows. And the, com the comparison is compared to people, stimulant users compared to um, regular controls. So what we see is here that for both methamphetamine and cocaine, we see that um, uh, the dopamine synthesis goes down, the dopamine transporter is blocked, it doesn't work as well, uh, it, the dopamine release is, 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 re is reduced compared to controls, um, and uh, that's happening on this side of the cell. Uh, which leads all this dopamine in here to have the effects of the stimulant effects that cause the euphoria that we that we hear from our participants and our patients. Uh, but what also happens over here on the postsynaptic side is you see a reduction in D2, D3 uh, dopamine receptor D density. And why is that uh, density? And why is that important? Because those receptors need to be there to capture the dopamine to transmit the message forward. So if, with fewer of those there, um, the, there is... Uh, uh, a blunting of the dopamine response, uh, uh, theoretically. Uh, in terms of this block, this reverse transporter into the cleft, uh, the VMAT, which is the vesicular monoamine, monoamine transporter two mechanism of bringing um, um, uh, dopamine to the to the to, to the to the cleft and dumping it, um, that that gets disrupted. Um, what ends up happening here is that you, in, in recent abstinence, VMAT2 goes up, which means that you have more dopamine being packaged in vesicles and, 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 and dumped into the, into, the, into, the, into the synapse, which actually means that it corresponds with that report of the honeymoon stage of early abstinence when you feel fairly normal. But then with continued abstinence, what happens is people will complain of um, feeling chronically, you know, foggy, not doing so well. And that corresponds also with this VMAT to having reduction in terms of um, its functioning compared to uh, controls over time. So, so this is sort of the architecture in the dopaminergic system that is affecting people and how they, um, and how they experience their drug, both while they're actively using and when they stop using. Um, that's important because when you think about where people are with their drugs, thinking about those neurons and those transmitters is an important, uh, it's a, an important strategy to remember. Um, let's do a case. Let's do your intake with James. So um, James is a 42 year old black African-American man who is seeing you because his partner John said he must. John is complaining that James' weekend warrior use of methamphetamine is interfering with their life together. James tells you this is impossible as he is in long-term recovery from addiction to crack cocaine from 20 years ago. James says meth isn't crack and his experience in recovery helps him to control his meth use. James became HIV positive three months ago and started HIV treatment and currently is virally suppressed, which means he's got a good response to his HIV antiretrovirals. James smokes about a pack or a pack and a half a day, and he smokes 
Newports. That's a tip of the hat to uh, one of my postdocs or uh, new, fa new faculty people who studies uh, menthol cigarettes in African American, uh, and the marketing of menthols in, in, in the US for African American smokers. So what is your primary treatment goal? I mean, which, not that you wouldn't do all these, but which is the one thing that you would actually do first? Would you advise James to stop his methamphetamine use, to reduce his methamphetamine use, to stop smoking cigarettes, and or to coordinate treatment with the infectious disease physician? So I, I know he should do all these things, but what is your first goal with James in the intake? Vote your conscience. Okay, how, so how are we doing on the poll? Still coming in. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and stop coming in if you can close the poll. All right, all right, awesome. All right, so your primary treatment goal is to stop, the, the, the least one was to stop methamphetamine use, um, a very strong response for reduced methamphetamine use, um, a good number of people were asking James to stop smoking, and uh, the, the number one reason is to, uh, things to do is to coordinate treatment with infectious disease physician. Okay, so these are really good responses because there's really no right answer here. You know, in terms of stopping methamphetamine use, one of the things that we know when we treat people is they often don't know that they can't stop until they try to stop and can't quit. So asking James to stop methamphetamine use is a good idea. Reducing methamphetamine use may be a better idea, given that he's a weekend warrior, meaning that he can put together periods of abstinence during his use periods. So getting away from drug is not necessarily his biggest problem. He's not using every day. He's using on the weekends or every other weekend. So he can actually stop for some period, but realistically what he's not able to do is to stop altogether. So reducing that methamphetamine use maybe by increasing the time between he, he, when he uses methamphetamine might be a good clinical experiment. Stopping cigarette smoking is always good. And then coordinating treatment with infectious diseases is a, is a good idea as well, okay? So for pharmacotherapies, so this is, this is intended to lead us into the discussion of what do we do with our patients? So, so uh, Frances Levin and her group wrote a very lovely um, uh, review of medications for uh, cocaine use disorder. And I wrote a commentary, which was that is if, if we had an effective pharmacotherapy for cocaine use disorder, and you can insert methamphetamine in here as well, what would we want it to do? Well, first of all, we need to know what kind of medications there are. There are full agonists, full antagonists, medications that affect mood. <clears throat> there are cognitive enhancers. And then this, there's a new thing coming in that we'll talk about, this monoclonal antibody and uh, chelator medications. Um, what would these medications do if we were to design them? One would be to substitute for the stimulant effect. So the idea of having some ability to sustain um, within treatment goals by using a stimulant is a strong idea. Um, to block the stimulant effect, maybe by actually using an antagonist, you might be able to reduce the amount of craving or pull to the drug or the effects of the drug when you use it. Um, medications that affect mood, and there's a range of them, I didn't go into them here because they are they're, they're a large range, could relieve withdrawal or craving symptoms, which would actually change behavior in drug seeking or drug use. We all know that, co co that these stimulants affect uh, cognition um, and withdrawal or abstinence from these stimulants actually can also affect cognition. So the idea of being able to maybe affect cognition by helping people to pay attention better or have better resource in memory or being able to think better uh, or make decisions that are a little bit different, not shifted toward risk in the setting of recent loss, that that would be a good thing to do. And maybe there's a medication that could do that. And then finally, we're gonna talk about uh, today, uh, reversing overdose. But starting with the uh, medications, 
one of the things that we do know here is that um, Phil Coffin and uh, Grant Colfax have done the hardest thing in science, which is the same thing twice. Um, in 30 milligrams a day of mirtazapine in men who have sex with men, what we see is about a 15 to 18% reduction from the beginning of the trial over 12 weeks in use of methamphetamine as measured by positive urine tests for methamphetamine. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the slope in here from the first study, which was a smaller study of 60 patients, um, and then 120 patients in this replication trial that Phil Coffin published last year showing a similar sort of slope. It looks steeper, but it's actually just compressed. Um, in both studies, the number needed to treat was uh, at, at 12 weeks, at the end of 12 weeks was eight. Uh, by comparison, just to remind you that the number needed to treat a Vivitrol to, um, for heavy drinking days is about 12. So here we have the idea of you know, eight people using this medication to actually see an effect um, is, is well within the range of where we think we, we are comfortable in marketing medications for addictive disorders. So this is the first salvo in making the point that perhaps we have some things on the table if we look at them um, in the way that we do consistently for other um, addiction drugs. Um, all right, so mirtazapine, uh, just to also to remind, your, remind us all, mirtazapine 30 milligrams a day is taken an, uh, in the evening. And this study was, both of these studies were done in San Francisco among men who have sex with men. So there's work ongoing to see if we can broaden that um, and see that whether this is a, a, broad, a, you know, a strong signal that we can observe in um, larger populations. Maduka Trevedian group in the CTN published in January a New England Journal article showing that the combination of extended release naltrexone, 380 milligrams every three weeks, plus 450 milligrams of bupropion every day, uh, resulted in a total of 11.1% of subjects who were able to have a treatment response to the medication compared to a placebo condition. So I'm going to walk us through a little bit of this. There are a few things worth noting. One is the extended release naltrexone administration was every three weeks, not every four weeks. So one of the reasons is because the idea here is that um, the extended release naltrexone has a decay rate that probably is okay at 28 days. But realistically, if we want to be able to test a medication at the highest steady state, then that third, that fourth week actually is not all that helpful in being able to understand what's going on. So Maduker said, why don't we just do it every three weeks, which is, I think is pretty smart. And then thinking about testing bupropion going to the highest possible dose that we can test, 450 milligrams a day, as opposed to say 300 or 150, addresses the issue that often in our trials, we don't test at levels that um, we, we underdose. So sometimes we discard a medication because we, our data doesn't look good, but it could very well be that we just didn't test the right dose. So this is the, down here, these, this is the data over time. And you can see here that people who are randomized to active, the pink or the, the placebo, the green, were randomized into a one to three ratio of active to placebo. And the reason for that was because often there is in these clinical trials, my group has published on this, that there's a strong placebo effect in terms of what happens to people in these medication trials. That, and and it's, it's a signal, it's there, and you can see it, and it needs to be controlled for in the clinical trial. The, what Maduker did in the group was to say that we'll set an evaluation period in the last two weeks of two six-week stages, so weeks five and six, and again in weeks 11 and 12. So when people got to the end of week six, they, they counted up the number of clean, uh, I'm sorry, the negative urine tests during these, um, these this two weeks, if it was three or four, then they were continuing on placebo. And if it was less than three, then it, they were randomized in one-to-one -one active to placebo for the next six weeks. And again, re responding. You can see here again, the evaluation period last two weeks. And here we see as, again, a significant improvement of the medication combination compared to the placebo. Why is this important? Well, it, because number one, it's a broad signal. It's 403 patients. It's about 18% of reduction of methamphetamine use over time. And it's a very strong uh, design that tests these questions. A lot more data are coming out about this. But in secondary outcomes, we see a similar sort of parallel uh, difference between the 
medication conditions here with the red bars, red arrows versus the um, placebo conditions, the stage one, stage two with the, uh, with the blue bars here. And you can see across the percent of methamphetamine negative urines, uh, the uh, change in methamphetamine craving scores, the change in the PHQ-9 scores, and the change in the treatment effectiveness assessments. You can see that these all, uh, the, the medication combinations significantly produced outcomes consistent with superior performance. Um, moving to cocaine and medications, uh, Francis Levin published uh, a few years back a wonderful trial uh, among uh, people with cocaine use disorder who uh, had comorbid attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, testing mixed amphetamine salts extended release compared to placebo. And one of the wonderful things about the study is it has two dose levels, 60 and 80 milligrams. Often like we, we don't have dose levels in, in phase two studies. This one did, um, and it showed what we like, like to see here. This is the placebo, the percent of participants who had um, positive uh, who were using cocaine over the period versus the, the, the lower dose of, of the extended release uh, mixed amphetamine salts and then the higher dose. So this is called a dose effect response. So this is a very strong set of data showing that in this, you know, co this comorbid group of cocaine use and ADHD, we see this, this level of improvement in response going from placebo to low dose extended release mixed amphetamine salts to high dose. Very strong signal of efficacy. John Mariani and Francis and um, Kyle Campman continued this work and did like the mirtazapine uh, studies, the same thing twice, showing very strong effects in a smaller trial, showing that you could basically double your rates of being able to produce three weeks of negative urines for cocaine um, using this uh, mixed amphetamine extend, uh, salts extended release plus topiramate up to 200 milligrams uh, during the 12-week the trial um, compared to placebo. Like seriously, that's, that's amazing. And Francis did just publish this in, in drug and alcohol dependence showing that she was able to replicate these findings in a larger trial showing the same sort of uh, response. And here's the positive urine toxicology um, uh, data showing a very strong slope, slope to the to, uh, decreasing use compared to placebo, where you have uh, increasing use over time. What does that mean? It means that this is a very strong er showing that the, the idea of providing stimulant treatment for cocaine use disorder is a strong idea, plus the topiramate. So in terms of looking at these, uh, these data, after 25 years, I can stand here today and I can say there are some signals for efficacy. We didn't have that when we started. We've tried a lot. We've, we've made a lot of errors, but yet there's still no FDA approved treatment for cocaine or methamphetamine addiction. Mirtazapine effects in men who have sex with men are impressive and the, the replication trial is particularly so. Um, but the effect is in reduction in use, not abstinence. And I will say this, that we need to be consistent in our thinking because now Trexone for heavy alcohol drinking as a reduction is exactly what the indication is for at the FDA. So the idea about thinking that we need to have abstinence, we, we've moved off that dime, but in terms of thinking about other medications that might work, we haven't quite gotten there to like open that opportunity for thinking that maybe there's some things that we can use. Um, so far, it's only been tested in San Francisco and only in men of sex with men. It's a large trial uh, for the extended release naltrexone plus bupropion over placebo. Um, and in cocaine use, mixed amphetamine salts show consistent signal, um, especially there's dose effects for people with ADHD. And by combining this with topiramate, we see this, again, this replication. So the evidence for, for, to consider medications as a foundation of treatment for stimulant use disorder is best depicted by this graphic. A foundation doesn't mean that that's all there is. It's a place to start building. For if you're one of those eight or nine people who show a response to some of these medications that are in that, uh, in that, in that range, you don't have to work at being able to do something to reduce your stimulant use. It's like, it just comes to you because that's what the medication does. So for the interventionist, it gives you more freedom, more opportunities to actually optimize or maximize that outcome by including 12-step or 
behavioral therapies or other sorts of approaches that might community-based approaches that might be actually um, helpful in, in helping your patients to meet their um, their, their stimulant use goals. But wait, there's more. The last thing I want to leave you with is this idea about um, an overdose medication. I'm working with a small company, Clear Scientific, um, and they have a compound called a, a small molecule, uh, 1103. It is, um, this, this is the data that shows the, re the elimination of meth in, uh, from these bodies. This, this, this small molecule has a half-life of about 20 minutes. Um, and an hour after giving exposure to this um, to this uh, CS1103, we can see almost, uh, almost elimination. 90% of the methamphetamine is removed from the body and captured in urine um, after, uh, after a toxic methamphetamine dose in these non-human primates. What happens is this chelating molecule finds methamphetamine. It matches you know, stereoscopically very nicely. It's held together with a valence charge. Uh, that compound, that, that complex is actually moved to the kidneys and excreted in urine or through feces, unprocessed. So this is a very exciting um, idea for um, thinking about like what will happen with uh, how we might be able to use something like this in emergency settings. Um, but this also seems to work, as we know, methamphetamine and fentanyl are somewhat shaped alike. Um, and cross-react in many of our uh, dipsticks and things like that. So, so what, what the company did is, what these guys did is they took rats and they exposed them to fentanyl for about 15 or 20 minutes. And they brought the study drug on at this point here. And what you can see over the next five minutes is that the uh, respiratory uh, ventilation, uh, the, the respiratory uh, depression that happened during from the method, from the fentanyl exposure was actually reversed in dose dependent fashion after five minutes of this medication, showing that it's also clearing met, uh, fentanyl from the body. Very interesting idea. Um, and uh, I think we'll be hearing more about this, but there are other ideas uh, in phase 1B and 2A, including antibody strategies with uh, Brooks Gentry and group at, uh, at Arkansas who are kind of looking at these ideas. So it's a very exciting time to be doing addiction science. Um, but we also have these behavior therapies that are changing neurobiology. But what do they do? They instill abstinence, maintain abstinence, prevent lapse or relapse, and they return to abstinence following abstinence or um, uh, lapse. So I, I like to talk here, I like to start this sort of idea about behavioral therapies, showing the work of Rebecca McKeaton from several years ago, showing that when you have behavioral therapies in a quasi-experimental design, uh, we can see what happens over time. And so in, in Australia, people came into government, uh, to, to publicly funded treatment, and they, they actually signed up for this study, and they either got no treatment, this is not randomization, this is people choosing, they either got detox, or they got residential rehab. And they followed people um, three months, one year, and three years down the road. So this is this darker down here part at the base is the no use, the percent of people who are not using. This is self-report. Um, less, the white is used uh, less than weekly. Uh, this gray here is one to two days a week and the black is three days a week. And what we can see here in quasi-experimental fashion that the only significant difference at three years between the two groups is not much. And the only significant difference in the year after starting treatment really peaks around three months for residential rehab. So once people leave rehab, they sort of regress to the mean, they come back to their almost uh, to, to the peers level in terms of amount of drug use that they're using. So I, I use this as a point to remind people that the addiction, particularly stimulant addiction, is chronic and relapsing. And so it's not just gonna happen that you solve the problem with the patient you see that day. It's gonna continue for quite a while. So we need to think about this idea of stacking our interventions, the cheap available 12 step, the more expensive you know, counseling approaches, the idea of using contingency management, community-based uh, approaches, and then maybe intensive out inpatient or outpatient and then, in and then residential inpatient and thinking about people over their lifespan as opposed to you know, throwing the strongest intervention at them right now, thinking that that's going to help 
um, because generally speaking, the data are not all that impressive in terms of the interventions that we have in terms of just behavioral therapies by themselves. But the data that we do have show in meta-analyses that contingency management is the one treatment that, that there is a lot of data showing a, a, strong, a strong effect size. Operant conditioning is what contingency management is built on. The initial concepts were der derived from work with delinquent boys in group homes in Kansas, of all places. Um, um, early work in methadone maintenance clinics by Maxine Stitzer and the group in Baltimore encouraged people, used contingency management to encourage opioid abstinence to get access to take homes. Um, there was an application to cocaine dependence by Steve Higgins' group in Vermont in the early 90s. And then finally, you know. Nancy Petrie came on, on and showed us that not only can you do contingency management using vouchers, but you can use something called the fishbowl method. And, and here is Nancy. Uh, unfortunately, she's no longer with us. It's, it's been it's sad to leave. She, she left far too soon. Um, but here is the fishbowl method. And you can see here that she's got a, a fishbowl with a bunch of slips of paper in there. Um, and what happens is you, your urine results will determine how many draws out of the fishbowl you get. The first negative sample, you get three draws, increases by one or two or three for each consecutive ne negative sample to some number that's a cap. And of all those slips, 50 are for a good, 50 say good job on them. They don't say anything, they're not worth anything, they're just good jobs. Uh, 30 are a low prize of one to $2. Uh, 17 are a medium prize, five to $10. And three is this big prize. Um, on the right is something that my group has been more involved with is just vouchers or cash based we use vouchers uh, contingency management program showing that you know you have scheduled visits um, like say Monday and early in the week later in the week um, for each urine sample that is negative you get a certain amount it increases uh, from visit one to two with continued um, abstinence and because you've got two in a row you get a ten dollar bonus and you can see how this can uh, lead to a substantial amount of money within a 12 weeks a section. Now, this is about the level that I like to see where the schedules run. There's actually Nancy actually published on this showing like what you can expect, the amount of data, you, behavior change you can expect with the different schedules. And basically she said, you know, you get what you pay for. More intensive schedules actually help you produce more. But here at Columbia, Deanna Martinez actually published these data I, I love these data because they're the most elegant, showing that link between behavior and brain. Um, and she ran a cocaine use um, contingency management program for, for cocaine use disorder here, and then did PET studies of people at baseline and was able to show that at baseline, that people's available uh, dopamine D2, D3 receptor availability predicted outcomes from the contingency management 12 weeks in the future. And what we can see here is there's just like, these are the, these, these bars are the people who are responders to contingency management, and these are non-responders. And you can see that there is no normal curve here. You either responded or you didn't. And in fact, what makes this argument even stronger is that the responders actually had percent change in binding potential after a methyl, methylphenidate challenge um, versus the non-responders who didn't have a, a strong percent change. So it's like, this is, this is really showing that the availability and the functioning of that D2, D3 receptor availability predicts the outcomes of this behavioral therapy. Um, I think that's fascinating. This work has been replicated by Jean Jack Wang and Nora Volkov at Brookhaven, showing that the same sort of a, an association happens for talk therapies as well. That if you have this intact D2, D3 receptor availability system, you're significantly more likely to meet your abstinence goals um, than if you don't. Um, in terms of contingency management, what we also know is in, that across hundreds of trials, we see that there's a, a strong effect size. These are in the effect sizes in the range of antibiotics for infections. So, so these, this is a very strong level. These are hundreds of studies that have been uh, in meta-analyses over the past four years, um, or the four of these studies. And if contingency management were a medication, it would be a standard of care. Talking point about this is, that we need to be better able to use our data to drive our policy um, and to move uh, away from some of the pejorative language. Other behavioral therapies are cognitive behavioral therapy. Here's Kathy Carroll, who was taken from us this year as well. 
this last year as well. It's just just incredibly sad, um, the losses we've had over the past couple of years. Um, who is the who launched cognitive behavioral therapy, particularly for co cocaine addiction? And you can see on the left here is the uh, the tip that was published with NIDA the, in terms of therapy manuals for drug addiction. And it's it's a wonderful manual that, that goes through what what this technique does is it teaches skills to instill abstinence, uh, teaches early recovery skills, uh, use of a structure to schedule daily activities. This is an important thing um, because people who are recovering from stimulant use disorder will have forgotten how to run a schedule without using drugs, uh, how to do things like remove drug and uh, paraphernalia from where you live as a way of reducing your uh, likelihood to, to use again teaches skills to interrupt craving and things like thought stopping. Um, it teaches skills to return to abstinence following lapse or return to use. Um, and, and actually Kathy has a, a website. We've used this in some of our studies, CBT for CBT, computer-based therapy training for cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, it can be online, it's, it's, it's inexpensive and it's available widely. So one of the things that, one of the reasons why I like contingency management better than cognitive behavioral therapy, not only because the meta-analyses are a little bit stronger, but also because that the, the sort of fit between the brain in early abstinence and is, is, is sometimes not the sharpest. So the idea of having those vouchers being able to drive incentives and to be able to focus on uh, those short-term behavior changes that can be helpful in establishing abstinence um, is, is great, but the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy when you're not feeling well is hard because it is pretty teaching focused. It's, it's pretty teaching heavy. Another alternative is mo motivational interviewing as behavioral therapy. The basic assumptions are that people change their thinking um, and behavior along a series of stages. Um, individuals enter treatment at different stages. The natural process can be changed using motivational inter interviewing techniques, things like what's the pros, how's this medication, how's this drug working for you, how's it not working for you, help me understand how these relate. Um, it engages individuals in longer term treatment and it promotes specific behavior changes. And the hallmark of this is the confrontation of denial is avoided. Rolling with resistance is something we do in motivational interviewing. It's a, it's a highly skilled counseling technique and not, a, not everybody can do it. Um, but for those for who it works for, it's great. And that's my summary about behavioral therapies in general is that treatment works for who it works for. Um, and that's very important because often what we do when we treat people is we have an, a, a tool and we use that tool and we don't tend to use other tools. So sometimes a hammer is called for and other times a screwdriver we may have them in the tool shed, but we don't necessarily always go get them. Um, also the idea about chronicity when recommending treatments, being able to move up in intensity of treatment um, as opposed to always starting at the high end of uh, the intensity for people. Contingency management is highly efficacious, meaning that compared to a control condition, there is a consistent signal showing efficacy. This works every time it works in Cape Town, it works in Hanoi, it works in uh, London, it works here. This is something that is universal, it speaks to behavior, and it also speaks to that link between behavior and brain. Motivational interviewing, uh, the brief sessions, they're, 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 they, they do help move uh, behavior, particularly in people who um, can be uh, tough to work with, like adolescents, um, um, or people who have a lot of ambivalence about their behavior um, and, and the idea about behavior change. Cognitive behavioral therapy, as I said, is teachy, uh, but it actually has these meetings with therapists over weeks and months that help people to meet their substance use goals. And finally, for those for who it works for, 12 Steps is an ubiquitous social fellowship. It's not a therapy, but has effectiveness, meaning that it's available. It, whatever effect it has is low, but it's spread widely across the planet. And that in turn is that in turn, that, that total is far greater than anything we have in terms of behavioral therapies. So I want to start wrapping up at this point, but um, after 25 years of, of work, uh, I think what we know now is that stimulant use 
misuse stimulant disorder are all linked with neural adaptation that corresponds with development of addiction and that these can be targets for treatments. This is seems sort of obvious, but it's taken us 30 years to get here. There's still no broadly effective FDA approved medication for stimulant use disorder. Medications with some promise for methamphetamine are mirtazapine, uh, uh, extended release naltrexone plus high dose bupropion. Uh, for cocaine, we have stimulant treatments that show strong signal uh, with replication, with the, with the foundation of a stimulant involved, um, plus or minus topiramate, um, and in cocaine use disorder and in poly uh, or comorbid uh, people with, people with uh, uh, co-occurring conditions. Novel strat medication strategies provide new models for drug dependence development. And the whole idea of using a small molecule that is going to go chelate methamphetamine from blood as a way of removing methamphetamine from the human body to move, uh, to be used in emergency settings is really novel. And I think that there's other sorts of ideas. Broadly neutralizing antibodies may be helpful, but um, who knows? But this, this idea of actually pulling methamphetamine out of the body is, is very exciting. Um, and I'll be seeing a lot of that in my next five years, which is not that much more of it, but it's like, it is gonna be some of the fun work that I'm doing. Contingency management remains the most eff efficacious behavioral therapy, though for whatever reason, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy are used more. Um, and you know, some of my friends, Warren Bickle and others are showing that contingency management has, uh, its mechanism is based in neural, uh, neural adaptation, it's based in neural activation, particularly in areas of the brain that have to do with uh, arbiting decisions about risk in the setting of recent loss. And then, <clears throat> so all of this together, this corpus of data really does need to be respected. And it, for me, it, as somebody who has been in this field for a long time and have been waiting for the day, I think the day is here to start the question about whether stimulant addiction treatment should begin with the medication and then add some behavioral therapies with it. That this idea about people being more than just behavioral uh, people, who, people who have behavior that we need a behavior therapy for, or that they're more than just a medication can treat, that this idea about the whole person, the integrated strategy that provide the person the best chance to reach their goal about stimulant use treatment is, is where we need to focus. And that as we do that, we're going to bring increased efficacy um, in, into the treatments that we deliver, uh, respecting biology, behavior, and culture. Um, I think it's time for our field to engage this talk. I mean, it's, it's, we're somewhat at the same place we were when buprenorphine kind of came on board a long time ago. Uh, back when, well, at any rate, it's, it's been around, we take for granted that, the, that these medications for opioid use disorder have always been there, but they haven't. And we had a parallel discussion in our field about their place, and I think um, we continue that discussion. So I'm going to close with a, returning to James. So James comes back to see you the week after the intake. He tells you he's not interested in working with you to do things that he already knows how to do in establishing, in establishing some kind of recovery from that. In his early 20s, he was a member of Cocaine Anonymous, uh, or 12-step group, uh, for almost 12, 10 years, and he has no interest in returning to that program at all. James' medical insurance policy is comprehensive in coverage, so he can cover things like medications and, and a medical approach to treatment. He's not opposed to medications, but would uh, really like to be part of a contingency management program, but it's not available at your clinic. He doesn't want behavior change school. Those are his words, but he likes talking to you. So as you're sitting here designing your treatment now for meth with, with James, um, what do you choose? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, four sessions max, he doesn't want behavior change school, uh, extended release naltrexone plus bupropion, mirtazapine 30 milligrams a day, choices B and D, or choices A and C. So vote your conscience.
we can have the next poll. Unfortunately, we'll have to use the chat feature for this one. Okay, so we're gonna to have to use the chat feature for this one. So please put your um, choices into the chat. Everybody gets to choose. Okay, why don't we close it off here around this? So what do we see that's the more common choices here? A lot of E's, a lot of A's and C's. Some F's and E's and F's. Okay, great. So I'm going to walk us through this one. So, whoops, I don't know how to go back. So one of the one of the clues to this story is James is gay. So so we do know that mirtazapine has two trials among gay men for meth. So so. Actually, B and D, I think, have a little bit better response um, than A and C, um, although C is very strong as well. Uh, there are gay men who were part of the, uh, the ADAPT2 study, the combination medication study. Uh, those data are being looked at currently. I, I don't know what they show, uh, but the idea here about mirtazapine being trialed in, in gay men in San Francisco is, is something that actually um, is worth thinking about. The idea about doesn't want behavior change school is an important one. Um, when people tell you that they don't want a lot of multiple sessions of, of talk therapy, they really mean it. Um, and so the idea of being able to think about ways to work with people so that they, uh, you can keep them engaged in treatment um, is, is important. So for, from my perspective, I always thought that E would be the better choice. So. Okay. I don't know what happened here. So these are my references. Let's see here. I can bring this back up here. So I just wanted to give you my references. They're in the slide deck. And with that, I say thank you and I'll stop for questions. Okay, so thank you so much, Steve. That was an absolutely excellent talk. We have um, quite a few questions that have um, been written in the chat, but I'm gonna turn it over to Fran if she wants to um, kick off the, the questions and then I can help feed as, as they arise. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take, a, I'll take um, uh, the benefit of being the one speaking to ask a first question. Oh, first of all, Steve, that was a tour de force. I mean amazing talk. Um, I've, I've been getting uh, uh, personal uh, uh, texts from, from faculty telling me what a great talk it was. So congratulations on that. Um, I, you know, one of the big questions that we both have to deal with, and, and I'm just curious your thoughts, is how do you prepare the field for the change of thinking about uh, medications as a platform or, or as a foundation as you as you presented it, rather than simply an add-on after everything else fails, so to speak. Um, and you mentioned buprenorphine and it, the uptake of that did take a long time as we both know. So just curious what you think are the barriers or what are some of the issues, you know, insurance issues, of course, but what, what do you think or uh, how, how have you thought about this given having spent so many years doing research in this area? Well, thanks, Francis. Thanks for the kind words. I mean, I, I feel a bit more like a reporter. I mean, this is like, <laughs> 
this is you you have a major part of all this so it's like this is really a wonderful time to be doing this work um i think this is the best time to be talking about medications. And, and that's one of the reasons why I could, have, I could have focused on mechanisms. I could have focused on pharmacology. I could have focused on different sorts of things, but I've changed my talk because I feel like now is the time for people to go out and start making the point that we have medications for stimulant use disorder and we need to challenge our field. So it's gonna be, we don't have a Rickett Kieser or a pharmaceutical company that's going to take this work to the FDA. So we need a whole, I, I, this is above my pay grade, but somebody needs to think about how we move that forward. And the issue that you have mentioned with me often is that we have, you know, very few people who are going to buy these drugs. So this, this isn't going to be a blockbuster in terms of people coming in and, you know, being able to go to a pharmaceutical company and say, oh, you can make a lot of money with this. That's, that's just not there. This, this, this is, this is really the, government's perspective of this is a, a population where government is the treatment of last resort um, and the government has sponsored these trials and, and are, is showing this work and so uh, hopefully the schools of public health or business will take this on and begin to think about how we move this and, and market it but we're scientists, not marketers. So, so one of the things that we can do though is package science and so that's one of the reasons why I'm on the circuit now talking about ways that we can package this. Um, the other thing we can do is we can move across disciplines. So one of the things that I've seen that's very powerful is people like the emergency room physicians and other physicians who are very comfortable using medicine, medicines. Um, the, they are folks who are willing to adopt this. And in California, we have the Bridge to Recovery. It's all around the country. But those folks who are involved with Bridge are already writing prescriptions for mirtazapine, and they're already writing prescriptions for the uh, mixed amphet uh, for the uh, for uh, for the combination for methamphetamine, uh, uh, Vivitrol plus the bupropion. But they're also writing prescriptions for mixed amphetamine salts, extended release. So these are folks who actually are able to go engage that risk to benefit on question about what's best for their patient, and they'll they'll make it happen. In Medicaid expansion states like California, it's fairly easy to get those medications paid for so far. We've not seen pushback. We haven't seen a lot of problems in getting um, access to the medications if the doc wants to write the prescription. So, it, you know, some part of, of this argument starts to make me feel like this is an issue of will. Are we willing to actually be out there and advocate for these sorts of ideas? Um, some part of it means processing our language better making sure we're using highly technical terms like negative urines, uh, you know, abstinence goals, you know, those sorts of things that actually are more measurable rather than clean urine or, uh, you know, sober, you know, those sorts of, those, those sorts of wording changes that have to start with our scientific communities and then migrate out to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, people who are doing uh, the bulk of the treatment delivery out there. But that's a great question. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go to war. I'm, I'm suited up, ready to go. It's like, this is, this is, this is the challenge of the next 10 years. Okay. We both got to get on the road, I guess, more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or Zoom road, as they say. Yes. Um, this comes from a trainee. Um, it's a little, the question's a little long, but I'll read through because I think it's, it's up your alley. Um, Sam Quinones is a journalist who has written about changes in precursor prevalence in the synth in synthesis of methamphetamine, namely that in response to restriction of stereospecific precursors, such as ephedrine, that illicitly available methamphetamine is produced through more synthetic steps and therefore may contain more active components than it had previously. I was wondering if you could speak to how this affects potential pharmacotherapies, specifically chelating agents or antibodies. So that's a great, the Sam Quinone's paper is a really good one. It just came out in the Atlantic about a week and a half ago. Um, and for those of us who are on the circuit, there's some really great, great pictures to, you know, drop, pick and drop into our presentation. Um, methamphetamine is, is incredibly uh, powerful right now because of the P2P method. Uh, they have shifted away from the ephedrine sorts of approaches to, to making uh, methamphetamine and, and have shut down the mom and pop shop almost completely. So it's great for the environment. There's no big dumps for environmental waste. 
Um, and it may be good for brains, I don't know, because the issue of this, the way in which it's being produced right now is almost pharmaceutical grade. Um, and so the, the, the impurities are not great in terms of like affecting the effect of the methamphetamine. What that means for the chelating agent is it makes it simpler to actually find the find the methamphetamine in the blood and attach to it because it doesn't have like this altered compound structure that, that has methamphetamine and or is something else that's that's linked. So the idea here is, is that, I, and I don't know if that's true for the broadly neutralizing antibodies, but certainly it's true that the more true that the methamphetamine is to its crystalline structure, the, 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 the molecule would be better able to attach to it. So it actually will facilitate its effect. Another uh, question from a trainee, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of dizipramine? This is going back to the 1980s, Steve, uh, for stimulant use disorder. I've been there, done that. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think we want to do that. Um, the, the, the SSRIs are an interesting, now you see it, now you don't sort of thing. I think we had plenty of that in the uh, mid nineties. And, you know, there's been a number of people here at Columbia we had Nunez, um, other folks have looked at dizipramine, um, uh, Joy Schmitz, there's, there's just a whole bunch of folks. It makes a lot of sense, you know, use an antidepressant to address the, 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 the mood symptoms that are concomitant with the stimulant use and its, and, and, and its abstinence. But the reliable signal is not there. And I think that realistically we should move on. Okay. So, you know, we, I was talking with Diana Martinez earlier and, and she was saying things like uh, glutamatergic antagonists, kappa antagonists. There, there are other sorts of candidates that have profound effects um, that we know about already that if we want to go looking for new things, let's, let's go there. Um, you know, the, the other thing that's kind of related to this question is, you know, with the lack of an audience to buy this or a market to buy these medications, the pharmaceutical companies have eliminated medicinal chemistry. And, and they've done that largely anyway across the board. So, so the idea of, of actual designing a medication that would actually target a system or to target an approach, which was the beginning of my talk about if we had a medication, what would it do, is where we need to go back to. We need to target what it is we're gonna do design this, figure out the systems that are involved and design the molecule or the compound and test that. Good, great. Um, this, this comes from Derek Blevins, one of our faculty. I see a, a fair number of gay men with methamphetamine use disorder and convincing them to take metrazapine is extraordinarily difficult considering the significant risk of weight gain. Has this been observed as a treatment limitation in trials? So I talked to both Philip and to Grant about this very issue. Um, and they continue to be up on mirtazapine for a couple of reasons. One is, um, you know, mirtazapine at the at 30 milligrams is not as, it, it, it's not a dose effect. So like at 15 milligrams, you get the appetite thing happening. And at 30, it's not quite as bad, um, but it's not great. Um, but they're able to get um, men to take this medication who are concerned about body image. Um, and when talking with them, one of the things they talk about is that it's not sedating because the lower dose is usually more sedating, but 30 milligrams taken in the evening will actually help people go to sleep, which raises the question of what is mirtazapine doing? Um, and I do think that there is some, we've had these discussions that it may help restore sleep uh, architecture. Um, that there is an increase in slow wave sleep. Um, there's this benefit of mirtazapine um, that, that happens. One of the most disorganizing aspects of withdrawal from methamphetamine is that, is that disturbance of sleep in those early days, in the, in the middle days. So the mirtazapine, I think, if it's doing anything, is probably working along with sleep architecture. But if that, the, my, you know, Philip and, and Brant have both said that you know, among the gay men that they treat, that, that they don't have any problems getting them to take it. Well, that's interesting, yeah. Okay, um, this comes from Jeff Miller. Uh, could you speak about the similarities and differences between methamphetamine use when, methamphetamine when used as a drug of abuse and stimulant medications when used therapeutically to treat ADHD? Sure, it's all about dose. 
So if you're going to treat stimulant use, to, if you're going to treat ADHD or, or other, other disorders, you're going to stop raising dose at some point, whether it's 80 milligrams or 100, 100 milligrams or at some point, because you're going to stop seeing a dose, a, a, a dose response benefit. And at that point, then you're going to, if you go above that dose, you're likely to encounter just like side effects. So, so that's one of the reasons why people find that sweet spot in treating uh, these, the, these uh, hyperactive sorts of disorders is because the right dose is the one that eliminates the problem and doesn't cause side effects. So, so when we're talking about our, my participants, I mean, the average dose is a quarter gram of methamphetamine a day. So that's 250 milligrams. So, so we're really at the upper end. Now, there is a trial right now being led by Nadine Ezard um, and, and Michael Farrell at, at New South Wales, testing whether starting, you, you bring people onto, the, onto 250 milligrams of Listex, um, and then what you do is you drop the dose 50 milligrams every day as a way of treating withdrawal to take people from active high dose use to zero in five days. So the idea of, of, of taking people compared to placebo in those five days. It's a trial that's just getting started, but it, it does have some interesting sorts of thoughts about like, like pushing dose for stimulant use disorder close to where people are using it in the, in the environments and then working from that point down. Um, and you would never do that with somebody with ADHD, I don't think. I don't think that's where you would start. Right. That's a great question. Right. Th these are two questions together from uh, Bill Tucker. Uh, do properly used stimulants appear to have any long-term de deleterious effects on the CNS? And also, does ex excessive stimulant use have de deleterious chronic CNS effects? So, well, I, I could do a whole lecture on that. <laughs> <laughs> so short answer is when you're using stimulants, therapeutically in low dose range, there does not appear to be long-term effects that are measurable. Um, if you actually, timing is important in children. If you wait too long to start a psychostimulant, um, you actually predispose risk to, to addiction or substance use disorders later in their adolescence. Um, so, so there's something that goes on in there, I don't know. Um, but in terms of you know, a high dose, um, exposure to stimulants over time. There's a lot of evidence that shows that there's some substantial CNS involvement, but it's not at the level of Parkinson's. So what happens with methamphetamine is it affects the dendrites. It goes in, you know, messes up with that VMAT uh, transporter so that there's free-floating dopamine in, in the dendrites, which is oxidative and it causes the blebbing of those processes. Um, so processes die off as a result of methamphetamine use as a high dose, but the nerve cells don't. So when you stop using methamphetamine, those processes regenerate. So that's good, but you know, it sort of makes you think about this re recovery is almost like stroke recovery because those processes are where memories or they're in the areas of, of, of hippocampal amygdala. So it's, it's, it's memories, it's emotion, it's uh, orbital frontal cortex, it's decision-making that if those are the processes that are involved, when you're needing to have access to those processes when you're engaging that behavior, they're not gonna be there. So you have to retrain your brain. Um, and I think this, from years of experience, that's why it's hard to get people through that months, you know, two to six, where you actually really have to get people to kind of retrain their brain to, to, to grow, while those processes are re-emerging. Re um, um, I have no data on that. But I do have neuroscience. It sounds good. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Uh, this comes from Meg Haney. Um, is the resistance to CM lessening, or is it still an uphill battle convincing people that some financial payment has long term benefit? So that's a great question, Meg. Uh, you know, in California, we are a blue state, and I was one of the state, um, uh, the state this year. Uh, Scott Weiner from San Francisco sponsored legislation so that we could raise the limit of, um, uh, of incentives per year per person for contingency management from its current $65. 
So it was to go up to like $600 or something like that. It, I, I testified in, in support. I was one of the two testi you know, expert witnesses and both the House uh, the legislature and the Senate, the assembly and the legislature and the Senate in the, in the California assembly actually passed this. I went to Gavin Newsom's desk and he vetoed it. Mm -hmm. And because partly because the papers were publishing uh, Newsom considering whether to pay addicts to not use drugs, you know, and, and that, that was where it ended. Um, he did leave it open so that there is a pilot project in California, and it's it's a it's a strong pilot. I mean, he is allowing anybody who wants to ask petition the permission to move up their voucher limit on on contingency management in California. But it's still it's a weenie response. I mean, it's it's just not a robust response. We need a scientific we need a response based on scientific efficacy. This works. We don't need more pilot studies. This just needs to be integrated. That this idea about politics and science is really very difficult these days. Um, but this, I, I, I have to say, that was a crisis of confidence that a blue governor in a blue state with a blue assembly and a blue Senate couldn't get this through. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Um, Meanwhile, it's in, the, it's in the VA. Right, so, right, yeah. very robustly. You have to thank Karen Drexler for that too. She was very, she championed that. Um, Adam Basag is asking the question, can you talk about using OUD, opiate use disorder medications in patients with severe methamphetamine use disorder? Any recommendations for clinicians seeing those patients? Short answer, no. Um, we are starting CTN-110, which is a trial of buprenorphine sublocade uh, compared to placebo for um, people who are heavy methamphetamine users with mild opioid use disorder or opioid misuse. So um, one of the one of the reasons why I'm cagey with my answer is because we don't we don't collect the epi on the numbers of people who are regular methamphetamine users and the level at which they integrate opioids in their in their methamphetamine use. That's a that's a need for for epi, but in terms of treatment, there's some there's some non-randomized trials. Judith Tsui has a report in JSAT showing that for people who are in opioid treatment, um, if they're on buprenorphine compared to methadone, they tend to stay in treatment better if they're on buprenorphine um, uh, over the long term. And if they are on buprenorphine over the long term, they'll reduce their methamphetamine use. So that's the other side of the coin, the people who have moderate or severe levels of opioid use disorder and seeing that maybe that's a signal of, of kappa antagonist, or maybe it's just that the people who stay in treatment are more ordered in their behavior. So I don't know. Okay, and maybe this will be the final question. Um, this comes from Ned Nunez, again, saying wonderful talk. You're getting a lot of that. Uh, my question is that methamphetamine patients I've seen in New York City were remarkable to me in their social isolation. Most had burnt or lost all bridges to friends or significant others, except maybe one tenuous connection. Virtually their only human contact is drug or sex buddies who they say they don't want as friends. Any thought about how to address this therapeutically? So I do spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, and it is the case that, Ned, you're the ultimate psychiatrist. I mean, you really nailed it. This is really amazing. I've never seen anything quite like it. And it's only getting worse. It seems like that, you know, COVID doesn't help anything. But this, you know, as in every serious illness, as the illness progresses, uh, the, the response is to isolate, whether it's cancer, whether it's whatever it might be. And it's certainly the case with stimulant use disorder that as the, as the disease gets worse, people trim off their social connections. So, um, I don't want to do a TED talk that was already done, but the idea about the, the, the idea here about addiction treatment being connection is really what, what you have to do. And it's the hardest thing to do with these, with these people, getting them back out there for a lot of reasons. One is meth is often used to facilitate a kind of sex. It's, it's, it's when you're trying to hook up with people who are gay men, uh, you know, in the dominant heterosexual culture, there are ways that you do it, but often it links and it lays, it's overlain with methamphetamine use. So it's, it's tough getting people to find moderately reinforcing social activities three times a week, rinse and repeat, 
But that's, that's essentially what you have to do, which when you think about it is exactly what we do. We don't have methamphetamine use disorder every single week. So that idea of moving back toward health you know, of being able to go to that, that whole place of having those three, I don't know what it is about three, but it's three moderately reinforcing social activities in every week and then redoing that. So it's, uh, it's I think, I don't know, that's social change. Okay, do we, do we have time for another question or we're we, we done? <laughs> We are actually at time, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but um, what we can do is some of the questions that weren't asked, um, I can send them your way, Stephen, if you want to respond to me and I can get them to the answers to the folks Wonderful. that asked them. I am so honored to be here. I had a great time. I, I, you know, thank you for bringing me to New York. I was so <laughs> not wanting to do a Zoom call. So it's just good to see my friends and it's great to be in New York. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll tune in again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.